We're going to start today by reviewing our first. And uh, here's one of them. So let's see. Okay, now we're only missing one person. Um, actually, before I forget, uh, you guys are face to face, so we get to see each other in person next class. That means that uh, a couple of things that you should have been told yesterday bring a charge device with you Chromebook, laptop, something that you can use to access digital material, just like we do on the Zooms. Um, that we have, how many people we have in here? 15? So it's 12, 13, 14. Um, we're, the class is going to be kind of full towards the front, but if you're further away, what I'm going to try to do is run everything off of Zoom anyway. So instead of writing on a dry erase board where someone further back may not be able to see clearly, I might still do that some, um, I might write on my tablet and share it through Zoom. So make sure you have something that you can access through Zoom. So have a charge device with you, but also have paper and pencil so you can write things um, as needed or draw if you're not able to draw on your um, device. So bring a device. I think that's across all your classes. I keep my classroom a little bit chilly. So um, because I, I'm kind of active when I move around class, so if you get cold easily, make sure you bring a sweatshirt, hoodie, a jacket or something. You can bring your backpacks to class. Uh, you don't have to wear a badge like previous years, but you do have to wear a mask. I'll have to wear a mask. Um, so you guys have to wear a mask. Um, anything generic about school we can talk about and kind of discuss, but time is kind of tough today. So I wanna pace us on material instead. Um, coming into class today, you are supposed to have your equations one and equations two worksheets done to the best of your ability. So I want you to get those in front of you and I will answer questions on those. And I prefer the questions to stay verbal instead of the chat because I get lost in the chat. If that's not possible or uncomfortable, that's fine. You can put it in the chat, but it may be a slight delay before I see it. Um, so let's look at equations one, or two, one and two. Um, I will answer for up to 30 minutes, but no more than 30 minutes, anything you have on this, unless you guys are gold then I'll just hit the highlights in three minutes and move on. But last class took half an hour. So equations one, equations two, what did you get stuck on? What do you have questions on? Can you um, go? Number... go. <laughs> number two. <laughs> uh, number two on equations one or equations two? Um, equations one. All right, equations one. All right, let me save our role and mark the assignments. And and share the screen. All right, equations one, number two. All right, a kid on a bike doing uh, going 10 meters per second. Okay, so his velocity, his initial velocity equals 10 meters per second. He hits the brake and skids to a stop. So that means his final velocity is zero. And um, he does it in two seconds. So time equals two seconds. Or to avoid hitting a dog eight meters in front of him, I'm just gonna mark the dog being eight meters in front of him so we don't lose that. Does he avoid hitting the dog? If so, by how much? So it's at, we need to determine how far does it take him to stop. Now, I, I know our equations were all delta x, um, based. Today we're going to get into two-dimensional kinematics and so starting right now I'm going to make a change and I should have just made it this way last class. If it's talking about horizontal I'm going to call it delta y. If it's talking about vertical I'm going to call it delta x. Does it matter if you didn't do that? Absolutely not. I just want to start out today the same way I'm going to finish today and if it's moving horizontally that's in the y direct way. Is that right? No, I'm saying it wrong. Horizontal x vertical y. So this is horizontal. So this is delta x. We are looking for delta x is equal to question mark. Okay. Does he avoid hitting the dog? Well, what is not listed here? We don't have acceleration at all, right? So then we need to look at our formulas. Let me see where I have all written here. So if we're looking for our formulas, we're looking for one that without acceleration. So what formula is that? Tell me the formula without acceleration. Um, delta x equals one half v plus um, initial velocity times time. There you go. So now we're going to write our equation delta x equals one half of v plus v naught times time. And we're solving for delta x, which is really cool because now we don't have to rearrange the equation. It's already set up for us, meaning it's already solved for delta x. 
So this is perfect. I can just say one half times V, which is zero, plus V naught, which is 10, times T, which is two. So that equals half times 10 is five, times two, which equals 10. So delta X equals 10 meters. Well, the dog is eight meters in front of him. It takes him 10 meters to stop. So he's, the dog moves, okay? This is a very active dog. He does not get run over. No one wants to run over a cute little dog. So he stops two meters beyond dog's location. That answers the question, right? How much does he overshoot? He does avoid hitting the dog because the dog moved. No one's hitting dogs. But if the where the dog's warm spot on the ground was, because the dog had been there for a while, he overshot that and he went over by two meters. And that's just because we solved for how far did it, did it take him? And it took him 10 meters. So that's number two, equations one. What's the next one we want to look at? Question one on equations two. Okay, let's do that. Let's switch over to equations two and question one. All right. Now for this, like a lot of things, I'll draw a picture. I did not want to draw a picture on the last one because it was just a puppy dog. And my dogs are really awful drawings, but I can draw a ball like a crazy person. So a ball is thrown straight up in the air. All right, so here's my ball. Oop, I need the drawing tool. So here's my ball. Look at that ball. It's awesome. Thrown straight up in the air. Goes up with a velocity of, so that's my initial velocity, is equal to 63.7, 63.7 meters per second. Okay, um, let's talk about the things that we know before we get into all the questions, right? We know that it was thrown up at 63.7 uh, meters per second square, and it's gonna go up, and then eventually it's gonna come back down, right? And at that maximum height, at this height right here, what is the velocity? Let me ask a different way. When it's going up, it had a positive velocity. When it comes down, is that a negative velocity? Yes. Let's just shake our heads yes. Okay, there we go. All right, so if it's going up, that's the positive direction. So when it comes down, that's the negative direction. So that means it has a negative velocity because we're right, positive and negative are directional and velocities require direction. If we said that going up was positive 63, that means coming down must be negative something. To go from positive to negative, what do you have to pass through? Zero. Zero, yes. So that means the velocity up here is equal to zero meters per second. So when you throw something upwards, when it goes from up to down for a fraction moment in time at some point, it had to go from positive to negative, so it had to pass through zero, okay? Now, acceleration, what's causing this ball to, to slow down as it goes up and then speed up as it comes back down? What's that called? Gravity. Gravity, and then what's the, what's the quantity, magnitude of gravity? What's the number? Is it 10? 10. Now, in this case, we said upwards is positive and downwards is negative. So is it positive 10 or negative 10? Negative. Negative, because like, if I drop this ball, can you guys see me on the screen as well as my paper? So if I drop this ball, it went down. So we can test gravity from time to time. During a test, if you get confused, just like take your pencil. Oh, gravity's still down, so we're cool. Um, so we're gonna say that the acceleration is equal to negative 10 meters per second squared. And on some questions, we could decide that down is positive. But on this one, since we said we threw it upwards and called it positive, that means up is positive, down is negative. All right, so just looking at number one, before we got to any question, we've established three variables that we know. We know that the final velocity at the top of the trajectory is zero. We know the initial velocity was 63.7. And we know the acceleration along the way was negative 10 meters per second squared. So that's, that's number one. The, for the person that asked for number one, what letters do you want me to work? I was just confused because I only could find two variables, but now that you explained how to find the acceleration, I'm good. Okay, well, perfect. Um, now, you don't always use that final velocity of zero because if we look at 1A, it says, what's the velocity after three seconds? 
Well, now you're just going to use V naught and A in acceleration. You'll use time as three seconds and you're looking for the V. But if it says at its maximum height, then you're like, oh, well, at the maximum height, velocity is zero. So the, the, this was a good question because it's hitting on some things that we need to realize and need to, to understand. A couple of other need to knows would be if I say I drop something, the initial velocity is zero. If I throw something down, well, then I'm giving an initial velocity. But if I drop it, initial is zero. Um, if, let's see, if I drop something, initial is zero. I think I'll hit on all the other major ones. But if something comes up, I'll let you know. What's the next desired question worked? I could, uh, could you just do 1A just so we can like see how it works? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna work on the ones that you guys wanna see. So um, what is the velocity after three seconds? So we already said V naught is 63.7 meters per second. We said the acceleration is negative 10 meters per second square. Um, the problem in 1A says that time is equal to three seconds. And we're looking for velocity is our question mark but it did not mention anything about delta um, x. In this case, I'm gonna call it delta y because it's in the vertical. Delta y is not mentioned. So what equation do I wanna use here? What equation does not have a delta displacement? Botat. Botat, exactly right. See, I've already got you calling it Botat, that's awesome. V equals Botat. All right, and I'm looking for velocity and it's already solved for velocity, so there's no rearrangement. You guys are giving me the ones that I don't have to work really hard for. That's cool, because this, I can say V is equal to 63.7 plus negative 10, which I can simplify and just call, that's actually minus 10 plus a negative, just means minus. So minus 10 times three. So then V would equal 63.7 minus 30, so then velocity would equal what? 33.7 meters per second. I'm gonna look at my cheat sheet and yeah, that looks good enough. Thank you. No problem at all. Uh, pick other ones. I'll pick a hard one for us at the very end if we still have time, but pick ones that you guys are getting stuck on. I have a more general question. Like, can you put the answer key like on Canvas so we can check our work? On Friday, I'll post the answer keys on, for next week's stuff. So um, what I mean by that is, you know how every week is a different little click button to go to in Canvas? So mm -hmm. when you click to see next week's work at the bottom of next week's stuff, I'll make sure the keys are there and I'll post them on. I'll post them on Friday and I'll publish the page. So by three o'clock Friday, I'll make sure you have solutions to equations one and two at, at minimum. Um, I'll, anything else? If we're still actively working on it, I wanna make sure you're actively working. And by the way, too, some of these questions you guys should be emailing me too. I don't want you to get stuck early on and not get the work done because what we do today is just gonna compound the work you have to do if you get behind. So do not get behind. Make sure you're communicating with me. I, I had to send, I, not I had to, I responded to an email yesterday and I outlined, I think six problems and it took some time, but that's a part of it. I'm, I'm invested in your success and it's only gonna happen if we work together on it. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. For there was one someone D, asking, how do we, how do we find the height of the ball? 1D for one equations D. two. All right, let's scroll it up. Let's see what it says. What's the maximum height of the ball? Okay, well, what do we know? Tell me the things we know. The initial velocity is 63.7. The final velocity is zero and the acceleration is negative 10. And we're looking for a delta y. Okay, yes. and then what do we not have in this list? What's not listed? Time. Time, okay. And which equation has no time listed? The third one. Okay, and um, call it out to me. Tell me what it says. V squared equals initial velocity squared plus two times acceleration times um, delta X. Or delta okay, I'm just gonna use delta Y because it's in the vertical, right? Yes. Okay, but that's no change. All right, now for this one, we're solving for delta Y. So I need to isolate delta Y by itself, right? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna subtract V naught square from both sides. So I'm gonna have 
v square. I'm going to zoom this in so I've got like room to write. So I've got v square minus v naught squared is equal to 2 times a times delta y. If I divide both sides by 2a, it cancels on the right. So then if I move this up to over here, I would have v squared minus v naught squared over 2a is equal to delta y. Now I can just plug in um, v squared is 0, so I would have uh, 0 squared, which is still 0, minus 63.7, 63.7 squared over 2 times negative 10 equals delta y. Then you just solve. What's the next one? All right, let me ask you this. Is, was it that easy and we worked through it and these are the only questions or did we not really get to the work? Um, I have a question. What you got? Um, number four um, equations one. Number four equations one, all right. Okay, this is a velocity versus time graph. So in order to solve this, to get um, displacement, what we need to do is we need to understand what the um, area under the graph is. So what I would do is I would draw this rectangle right here and I would shade this in and get the area of this rectangle. And then I would get the area of this triangle and the area of this little triangle and add them up. And that gets me the area under the curve. Uh, the area I got was slightly different than the available options, but um, as long as there's something close to what you got, that's what you're looking for. So you didn't need to like plug this one into an equation? Nope. No, because we know the velocity versus time graph, the slopes give us acceleration and the um, area under the curve gives us displacement. And this asks us for displacement, I think. Let me scroll this. Um, yeah, it asks us how far the particle travels. Well, that's how far is is um, displacement. So the area under the graph gives me displacement. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Also, um, a good point on this one is the reason you cannot use the equations on this one is our equations have one acceleration, right? There's only one A. This graph has three different slopes. That means it has three different accelerations. So I could not use our formula one time on this graph. I would have to break it down and say, okay, well, the acceleration for the first four seconds was zero, the acceleration for the next four seconds was something different, and then the next four seconds was something. I'd have to set it up four times with kinematic equations because kinematic equations only allow for one A, not three A's. So to me, the, the best way to do it would be area under the graph. What else do you guys have? Can you do number nine on equations one? Number nine equations, yes. So let's scroll this up. Okay, an object starts from rest. Okay, so I'm gonna just write this in the margin. So I have V naught equals zero meters per second. Um, and uniformly, accelerates uniformly in a straight line in the positive X direction after 11 seconds. So time equals 11 seconds. Um, the speed is, all right, so my final velocity equals 70 meters per second. Okay, so those are my givens just from the, the statement at the top. So now I'm gonna look at what number nine asked me for. How far does the object travel during the first 11 seconds? All right, so it's still 11 seconds, that hasn't changed. Now I'm looking for delta X, because I'm imagining it's horizontally traveling, equals question mark. Um, I don't have acceleration listed for me here. I don't know what it is. So I'm gonna look for a formula with no acceleration. That should be formula number four, the trapezoidal equation. And if I flip over so I can just look at it while I write it. Um, see, we're doing number nine, right? 
So that would be delta x is equal to one half v plus v naught times t. Um, we are looking for delta x, so we do not have to rearrange the equation. We can, we can uh, substitute now, so we have one half. Um, v is 70 plus zero plus zero times t, which is 11. So 35 times 11 is delta x. So whatever 35 times 11 is, um, let's get a calculator, 35 times 11. I got 385. Um, 385 is really close to 390, so I'm going with 390. Could you go over question two on equations two? Question two, equations two, yes. All right, this will be the last one I take on request, and then I'm going to do um, one as well that I think will be helpful at the end of equations two. So question two, equations two. So let's find where question two is. And let me shrink this down so I can see it. Okay, so it's a, this is the right one, correct? Um, what maximum height? Yes. Okay, all right, so the maximum height reached by stone. So we're looking for uh, delta Y, because that's height is question mark by stone thrown straight at with an initial velocity of 35. So V, I already lost somebody. Man, smart area bailed from class, that's awesome. Equals 35 meters per second. Um, we need to know other things, right? What else do we know about when we throw something up in the air? What's the acceleration? Negative 10 mm -hmm. meters per second squared. Okay, and then at its maximum height, do we know anything about velocity? Wouldn't the velocity be zero since it's stop or not like? Yep, that's exactly right. And then the one thing we don't have listed at all here, there's nothing, no mention of time. So we're going to use the equation that doesn't have time. So if I flip back over to my equations, because I don't memorize anything, um, the one with no time is going to be the, looks like the second equation. So we'd have V squared is equal to V naught squared plus two A delta y. And then we're solving for delta y. So here we're going to subtract v naught square from both sides. And we'd have um, v square minus v naught squared is equal to 2a delta y. Divide both sides by 2a. Cancels on the right and we get v square minus v naught squared divided by 2a is equal to delta y. At this point, you can plug in the numbers from the table on the left where we listed them out and, um, and solve. Thank you. Absolutely. Let's take a look at, um, which one did I have to do? Oh, let's look at number eight on equations two. It's the very last problem. And it brings in a concept that's gonna be important when we're looking at this stuff. So we've got, I'm gonna put this where I can see everything at once. A ball is shot straight up from the surface of the earth. Okay, so here's my, here's my surface of the earth. Here's my ball. It's being shot straight up with an initial speed of, so my V naught is equal to 19.6 meters per second. Um, and that's all it says. But it's on earth, so we know the acceleration is going to be equal to negative 10 meters per second squared. Okay, well, we can deal with this, right? Because 19.6 is positive. It's moving upwards, so it's positive. Acceleration gravity is negative because acceleration gravity goes down. And when we forget, we can just grab something and let go of it and it goes down. So it's in the opposite direction, so therefore it's negative. Um, number eight says, how much time elapses between the throwing of the ball and its return to the or original origin? So we're looking for time. Now this ball is gonna go up and then it's gonna come back down, right? We need to know the time, question mark. But we only have two variables that we've solved for. We need a third variable. There is no way for me to solve for total time immediately. But I could say, let's solve for the halfway point up here at the top. When it hits the top, before it goes down, I could solve for that time, couldn't I? 
because what do I know about velocity up there? It's zero. It's zero, yeah. Velocity equals zero meters per second. Now I have three variables that I know and one that I can look for. I need to remember that when I solve for time right now, I'm solving for time at the top and the question asked for total time. But we'll deal with that in a minute. I'm just warning that we don't need to just jump on an answer when we get it, okay? Because it is tempting. So we've got everything except for there is no mention of any delta y. So we're gonna use the equation that has no delta y, which is my favorite equation, which is the VOTAT. All right, we are solving for time, so we are gonna rearrange. We're gonna subtract V naught from both sides. We're gonna have V minus V naught is equal to A times T. We want times to divide by A. And up here, I'm gonna just rewrite it V minus V naught, because those cancel out, over A is equal to T. All right, if we were taking the AP1 exam, we're done, but we're not, so we're not. All right, so then V is zero minus V naught, 19.6, divided by negative 10 equals T. 19.6 uh, divided by 10 should be 1.96. So 1.96 equals T, but this is for the halfway point. So we need to double 1.96. If I do that, what is this? A two, carry my one, eight, nine, carry my one, three. 3.92 seconds equals time. That is our answer because that's total time. If it takes 1.96 to go up, it's going to take 1.96 to come back down. It's just the way it is. The time up is equal to time down. If it's 3.92 is the answer that we like, the closest answer is answer A. The tempting part is to stop once you get time. Forget you'd only done time for maximum height and select B. So if it says um, time to the maximum height, that's the halfway point. If it tells you total time for the entire trip, you gotta make sure you calculate for the half time and then double it, okay? I wanted to make sure I pointed that one out because there's some concepts there that we need to get familiar with. Um, you need to get these taken care of and done as quickly as possible because we're quickly moving into, right now we're moving into projectiles and it's gonna be critical that you have this all behind you and you're ready to move forward. We have one more class after today. Um, we'll be face-to-face -face on Tuesday. Yeah, we're face-to-face -face on Tuesday where we'll finish projectiles. And then on Thursday, we'll have a quiz. The quiz will cover um, graphs. Um, it's gonna be most similar to gr the graphs three worksheet. So go back to your graphs three. Um, it's not taken from it necessarily, but it's gonna look like it. So make sure you're comfortable with that. Um, don't spend a lot of time focusing on the quiz because after the quiz is on Thursday of next week, the following Monday is the test. There's no, you turn in the quiz and then all of a sudden you come back and I hand you a test. So I want to make sure you guys are focused on what's really important, which is the test. And that's going to cover kinematics all the way through projectiles. It's going to start at graphing and go all the way through projectiles. All right, so let's look at this. Um, first though, let me stop my share. Are the quiz and the test going to be online? Um, you're going to do it in class, but it's going to be Canvas based. Okay. So um, you'll do it sitting here in front of me, but you'll all have your devices out and you'll be doing it. Um, the quiz will be multiple choice and then the test will be half multiple choice, half free response. Um, in the multiple choice of the test, it will be pure multiple choice. It won't be like the last time where you're drawing a graph and submitting it in the multiple choice section. So it'll be multiple choice one side and there'll be a time limit and then there'll be a writing portion that will have a time limit. Um, setting us up, uh, go ahead. Sorry, I was gonna ask like, are we able to use like our notes and stuff? No, 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 no. You can use an, you can use a formula chart I'll have any pertinent formulas also on the board. So if you don't like formula charts and you just wanna look at the dry erase board, it will be there. You can use calculators and your brain. Um, you'll have your devices open, which is cool, but I'll stand behind you. So that way it just, um, any temptation to sneak a peek at something um, that would not be honest test taking will be reduced because I'll see what's on your screen. Okay, so that gets us to this point. All right, um, 
since we're talking about projectiles with gravity and we've seen how gravity affects everything equally, I want to share this video. In first period, it was kind of sketchy for how it played. So what I'm going to try to do is, is if it does the same thing, um, just start talking and tell me that it's not playing well. I'll try to monitor it as well. If so, I'll just fast forward to the highlights. But um, it is a little bit interesting. It is four minutes long. So just bear with it. It's kind of a a guy with an accent, so you have to get over the accent, but outside of that, it's an interesting video. So let me share this with you, and then we'll uh, we'll go from there. So. And it's kind of got an eccentric construction, which is part of its history. It was built in the 1960s as a nuclear test facility to test nuclear propulsion systems. And that meant that they built it out of aluminium to make the radiation easier to deal with. Aluminium is not the best thing, the strongest material to build a vacuum chamber out of. So they built an outer concrete skin, which is part radiation. Okay, we don't need the last minute of awe and surprise, but it shows us that with an absence of air resistance that things are being affected by gravity equally. A bowling ball and the feathers, they fell without any variation in their um, relative motion, right? They were right together all the way down. So it's kind of cool to see that. Um, so that just helps us go into this when we're looking at applying gravity equally to everything. This just kind of showed that as a demonstration. So let's see what we have next. Did that, did that, all right, vectors in free fall. So let me show you where I'm gonna get the information that we're doing today. Um, let me get out of this and let's go to dashboard. All right, let me share this and that way you know, because you're going to have to grab a hold of this stuff yourself. If we go into our course for physics and you know you go into coursework, um, if you haven't seen this before, this is where the Zoom class recordings are. So if you miss a class or if you just need, I need to go back and put in the titles, but these are all of our classes um, for the Zoom recordings. So you can actually go back and get any of that information that you missed. Um, and then tutorial times and all that stuff are in here as well. But I'm going into the coursework. We are in kinematics. And if you scroll up, today is listed. I can't see it because there's stuff stacked up. Let me see. Listed right here. And today is Wednesday, Thursday. So we've reviewed equations one and two worksheets. We just did gravity in a vacuum video. Now this free fall and projectiles, when you click on that, that's going to take you into the work that we're doing today. At the end of class, you're going to do a concept check. This is going to just give you a quick check to see how well you're doing with the subject matter. It's not graded, though it will give you a grade, and I'll get to see how well you're doing as well. So get this done today. Homework, you're going to see this is embedded inside of the um, free fall and projectile. So if you click on it, this is the worksheets we're working on today and we're working through. We're going to do almost all of it except for the last two pages are going to be assigned to you. So projectiles one, page two, projectiles two, page one. All right, so I'm going to stop my share there. Now you've seen where it is in Canvas. You know what to get. You know what you're going to be working on. Let's do that together. So let me come back over to this computer because it's so much fun. Yes, it is. Let's see, you already share that. All right, so we don't need equations one or two. We need this one right there. All right, projectiles. And I bet all my work from previous class is going to be sitting here, is it? Yes, look at that, all that work I had to do. Let me erase everything that we did before in first period. This is what happens when they don't give me any time. Somebody started asking another question, it was 1033, and I was like, oh wait, class is over. And if you're looking really quick at this before I erase it, when I go to ask a question in a few minutes, you're going to be like, I know the answer to that. Just because you saw the drawing. All right. So. Now, we're actually able to start actual class today and get through material that is new. Let's go through this and see what all it says. It says a ball is thrown straight upward and falls back to the same height. The student makes this graph of velocity of the ball as a function of time. Okay, so what I did when I was looking at this, if I cut this in half and just look at one half of the graph at a time, okay? So when he throws the ball up, it has a high velocity, right? 
And as it reaches its maximum height, what does the velocity look like? All right, so you can't just do it like this. You got to talk. There you go. Talk. Unmute. Talk. Zero. It goes to zero. Right. Yeah. When it gets to the maximum height, it goes to zero. Is that what the graph shows us? Yes. Yes. There's one brave soul. That's awesome. Three people said zero. One person says yes. That's absolutely what the graph shows us. What does the graph say the ball does next? Ball is kicked down. So the ball is thrown straight upward. What does the graph tell us the ball does? It's going up. Yeah. The graph, the way the graph's drawn, it says it goes up at a high velocity and it slows down to a stop and then it speeds back up in an upward velocity. That would be a pretty good trick because if I threw a ball up in the air and it slowed down as it went 100 meters up and then it stopped and then it sped back up going upwards, that'd be pretty cool. Um, is that really what happens? Certainly not. What we would expect this graph to look like would be this and not that. Why? Because it would be falling, so it would be a negative velocity. Absolutely right. Any other way to say that? Um, how much, how many things are influencing the acceleration of this? How many accelerations does this object experience throughout its path? Are there multiple accelerations? Just one? There's two. Tell me the sources of those accelerations. Um, when it's thrown in the air and then when it's falling back down. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm going to remove the first one because we're only going to consider the flight of the ball after it leaves the boy's hand or the girl's hand, whoever threw it. So once the person releases it, I'm going to just dwell on the acceleration, the second one you said, which is gravity, right? So the slope of that velocity line should be equal to gravity, right? The whole time. It's a single force giving it a single acceleration. Therefore, the velocity versus time graph should be a linear line that has a single value for the slope. In this case, we would hope that the slope equals negative 10 meters per second squared because that's what we learned for gravity, right? And the only way that that slope's gonna change is, is if there's something else influencing the acceleration. So it just says, what if anything is wrong with the student's graph? If something's wrong, explain. That's what we did. How to correct it? That's what we did. We could have looked at this and just said, well, we know it changed directions. Therefore, it should go from positive to negative. Or we could say that we know that there's only one um, source of acceleration on this object. Therefore, there can only be one slope of this line. Either of those would have been fine. That finishes the whole first page, which is awesome. That went really fast which is about what we expected for that particular page. Let me shrink this one in so we can see it all at once because it is kind of stretched out. But basically we have a ball that's being thrown upward. This is its upward path. And as it goes up, it slows down and that's why you see it kind of appearing closer to itself. So this distance is, small, is bigger than this distance because it's slowing down. This is the, the top of its trajectory. And then they scooted it over, still the top of its trajectory. And this is it going down. Okay, so at the very top, what is the velocity at the top? Zero. zero. Yeah, don't be shy. Velocity equals zero meters per second. You guys got to get a lot more lively when you're in person or this class is going to suck. So anyway, we throw the ball up, right? It slows down as it comes to a top and then it speeds up as it comes down. Okay, we cool with that? Sort of. Okay, I can accept that. All right, and then what about its displacement over time? How do we want to draw that? Um, we could draw it, if we want to say the ground is the origin, we can draw it this way, right? That's its displacement over time in the Y, because the Y is the vertical. Um, if the ground is the origin, that's what it would look like. It went up and away from the origin, and then it came back down to the origin. If we graphed its velocity, we would say that it started at a high velocity. We can go back and we can use our tangential lines. We can say high velocity, zero velocity, negative velocity. And if we did that, 
the velocity graph starts out positive, goes through zero, and ends negative, right? So our velocity graph would look something like that. It has one slope because it only has one acceleration being gravity. And then if we were to look at the slope of that and say, well, what's the acceleration? Or we could say, I know the acceleration of gravity, either one. I can come in and I can graph acceleration and I can put it like right there, make it look parallel. And then I can draw the little ends to it and say like, it keeps going that way. Like this one keeps going that way, that sort of thing. So now we can just kind of visualize ball goes up, comes to a stop, comes back down. And it came to a stop so quickly, no one really noticed, but hey, it had to have, because it went from positive to negative, so it had to pass through zero. We're cool there. So I'm gonna scroll this guy up just a touch. And for some reason, this is written backwards because this upward path is that guy right there. And this downward path is that guy right there. It's okay, I mean, just whatever. So the direction, let's look at the downward path first because that's the one they put in the table first. The direction of the velocity, is it positive or negative on the downward path? Negative. Negative, yeah, cool. What about the direction of the acceleration, positive or negative? Negative. Negative. All right, the resulting effect on the speed, was it speeding up or slowing down as it came down? Speeding up. Speeding up. Speeding up, so plus. Okay, on the upward path, the direction of the velocity was positive or negative? It's not a trick question. On the positive. upward path, it's positive. Yeah, because up is positive, so positive. All right, direction of the acceleration? Negative. Negative. Only one brave soul. All right, the effect on its speed, was it speeding up or slowing down? Slowing down. Slowing down. Yeah. You see how one brave soul told everything to get the, to the easy question and everybody pitches in there. I'm just kidding. You guys got a smile. I got like one smile and three like really bad frowns. I see four people at a time. And right now I've got one guy that's like, I totally get this class. And the other three people are like, I don't want to hear it today. So sorry, I don't know what's going on, but I hope you guys are happy. All right, we have a blank page. Yes, it is a blank page. And did I just lose another student? Seriously, let me see how many participants. And they're dropping like flies. All right, so blank page, and it goes into projectiles one. So there's a projectiles one and a projectiles two. We're gonna go through page one together, and we'll get into page two together, and then that's when we're gonna call it a day. And it looks like we're doing pretty decent on time, so let's get through as best we can. Let me zoom this in so I got plenty of writing room. And let's talk about some generalities, okay? Number one question, it says, in order for a moving object to be considered a projectile, what must be true of it? Tell me what must be true. What do we know? All projectiles have what acting on it? Gravity. 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 See, you guys are smart. You're listening. You're trying at least. The only force acting on it is gravity. So that is what must be true. So I'm going to write it, make sure my pen is like, yep, um, only force acting on object is gravity. Okay, so if that is true, why is an airplane not a projectile? Two reasons. Okay, how about one reason? Is it because like it's thrust cancels out gravity? Okay, uh, well, thrust doesn't cancel gravity, but I see what you're saying. Um, thrust makes it go forward. There's something else that cancels the gravity. <clears throat> so gravity pulls down, but thrust makes you go forward. And since those are perpendicular, they don't interact. But I get what you're saying. So I'm gonna say that um, the airplane has engines, right? Engines, I hope that's how you spell it, engines. And engines provide thrust which is a force. Therefore, it has a force other than gravity acting on it. All right, well, that's one. Give me the other one. Okay, is it, it lift, lift then? Lift, lift comes from the wings. Wings give us lift. Lift opposes gravity, and this is also a force. So you have one, two forces that an airplane has that is not gravity, 
therefore it is not a projectile. Now, if the wings fell off and the engines were on the wings, then it's a projectile. It's a very sad situation, but it's a projectile. And we're gonna say, you know, just on a toy model plane, not on a person plane. Okay, what one assumption do we make about objects as projectiles that may not be totally true? And the hint is it had a lot to do with the video you just watched. That if something is lighter than a heavier object, it'll go slower. Yes, well, that's a that's a very bad assumption. But what do we, what assumptions do we make in our calculations? That the air is acting on it. Yes, I was going to say because if I were to say I have a feather and a bowling ball and I drop them, use your kinematic equations, you would get that they move the same velocity, right? Because we don't account for air resistance. So the assumption that we make is is that there there is. Oh, that's a terrible S. There is no air resistance. And what does it go on to say? Is that okay? Yes, of course it's okay. Otherwise we wouldn't do it. So I'm gonna say sure, but it introduces errors. Introduces errors. There we go. All right, so we're gonna say air resistance does not exist in this classroom. It doesn't exist in physics in high school pretty much and not much in college either um, because there's too many factors and we can kind of isolate other things and solve and we can just say, well, air resistance was negligible. All right, so then it says, if I am walking through the room at a constant speed and drop a marker, where does it land in relation to me? That is a good question. Do we wanna try it or just try to, or just answer it? We wanna try it, let's try this. So let me scroll this up. If I'm walking through a room, all right, cool. Let me find a marker. Ha, marker. And let me stop this so you like you get a full screen view. So bang. there we go. You guys can see me, you can see a marker, cool. And this is your future home. In the classroom, all right. So if we bring this forward and we tilt this down so you can see that I do wear shoes. All right, here's marker in my hand. All right, so this will be my practice walk. So this is me walking, right? So then if I drop this marker, where is it gonna land relative where I let go of it? So I'm gonna walk. Okay, could you see it? Did it land right above where I dropped it or did it land next to me? Next to you. Why? That's the risk of answering a question. You get an extra question thrown at you. Why? Why did it land next to me? The last homework you turned in, what was the title of the homework? Oh, people are going to dig through their notes. Relative right? motion. Relative motion. Relative motion, yes. We had the same relative motion when I let go of this marker. When I let go of this marker, that allowed gravity. Look, there's somebody behind me. All right, when I let go of this marker, um, it allowed gravity to act on it, right? But gravity acts in the vertical up and down, it pulls down, right? It does not act in the horizontal. So the marker maintained the same relative motion horizontal with me. Just because the, um, just because the gravity pulled it to the ground did not change the fact that it was moving forward with me. Does that make sense? I hope so. Try it. I mean, walk through your house and keep dropping markers and get your mom to get, yell at you for dropping markers all over the place. Make sure the caps are on though. All right, so I'll set this down. Give me a second and I'll be back over there. Okay. All right, so let's go back to the work. If it'll let me share application. Share. Here we go. So where does it um, land in relation to me? It was next to me. Me and why? Because we had the same relative motion. We were both, me and the marker both were moving the same velocity horizontally when I let go of it. Um, where does it land in relation to the point from which it was dropped? Well, this one's kind of easy because while I was walking, I dropped it and it stayed with me. So it was forward. It was beyond point 
it was dropped. And um, because it had motion in that X direction, so it conserved velocity in the X direction. There's no, there was no force acting on it to slow down that forward movement, that horizontal, that X direction movement. Remember, when I let go of it, the only force acting on it was gravity. That only affects in the vertical, not in the horizontal. We okay? Sort of, okay. At least eyeballs are open for the most part. That's cool. Um, oh, I can't scroll from that one. I have to scroll from this one. Okay, so then let's look at this. Um, I just scooted over so I can draw a picture. Student drops a coin from the top of a tower. So, okay, um, kind of mischievous student, but that's cool. So he's a peer or she. Let's say since someone's dropping a coin, it'll be a girl. Girl's dropping a coin because her boyfriend's down here and he broke up with her and she's mad. So she's trying to hit him in the head with a, no, I'm kidding. Just joking, not trying to upset anybody. 35 meters. All right, that's the drop of the coin 35 meters off of a tower. Not a very big tower at 35 meters, but hey, it's a tower. All right, so we've got this drawn. We can write out everything that we know. So if we dropped it, we it didn't say she threw it, it, she dropped it. So that means its initial velocity, V naught, is equal to zero meters per second, starting at zero because it was dropped, right? We know that the delta Y is equal to 35 meters. Uh, we know this is Earth, so we can say that the acceleration is equal to, in this case, because it's dropping it, it's going away from the origin. I'm going to call acceleration positive. Uh, you can call it negative. It's okay. You can be wrong, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. It's fine. For any question, you can dictate which way is positive or negative. I'm going to call downward as being positive because I want to pretend like the coin is speeding up and I don't want to have to deal with negatives because I'm lazy. So 10 meters per second squared. All right, those are the things we just know based on dropping a coin. So now sketch the vertical position of Y of the coin as a function of time. Okay, well, since I said it was, all right, the tempting thing here is gonna be to draw something where we draw it like something like this because it's falling. But since I created this and said that as it goes down, it becomes more positive, I really need to draw it and say that it looks like this because it's moving away from the origin in a positive direction and that incre and it increases in velocity as it goes along because it speeds up right it doesn't stay at zero and just hover there okay um, so i've graphed the position versus time and i'm saying that they're at the origin and i'm calling further away from the origin being positive and it's okay you can dictate positive and negative for each question um, sketch the vertical velocity of the coin as a function of time. Okay, well, I can do that because I remember tangential lines. I say that's near zero, that's a little positive, and that's way positive. So then if I selected shapes, I can say, well, I'm going to start here, and I'm just going to increase positive of velocity as it goes. The further it goes, the faster it's going to go. That's pretty easy so far. We can handle this. You guys are smart. How long does it take for the coin to hit the ground? All right, so it's asking me for time. Well, I've got all that stuff to my left listed out for me, but I don't have final velocity. So then I'm going to look at my equations and I'm going to find the one that does not include final velocity. And that would be delta Y is equal to V naught T plus one half AT squared. Okay, we wanna rearrange this and solve this for T, but I wanna point out that V naught is zero. If V naught is zero, zero times anything is also zero, so this is gone. Since V naught is zero, that portion is also equal to zero, so we don't have to deal with it. I'm gonna bring this down and just say, okay, let me clean this up. Delta Y is equal to one half A T squared. If I multiply both sides by two, because if you do it on the left, you gotta do it on the right. On the right, two times one half cancels out. And I have two delta Y is equal to A times T squared. I'm still looking for T, so divide both sides by A. 
two delta y divided by a is equal to t squared. It means I got to square root this mess in order to get just t. So I'm going to scoot this to like right there. The square root of two times delta y over a is equal to t. Now, if we we're taking our AP1 exam, we're done. We've solved it for t. But since we have numbers, we're going to take it that next step. And this is where we're going to plug in our numbers. 2 times 35, so I'm going to bring it to 2 times 35 is 70. Divided by 10 would be 7. Square root of 7, which is why I really need the calculator, gives me 2.65. Let's see if that's what I got when I did it. Yes. So I got 2.65 seconds is how long it takes for that coin to hit the ground. 2.65. Do I expect you to rearrange the equations each time before you put the numbers in? Yes. Is it okay that you didn't do that um, up to this point? Yeah, it's okay, but please go back and do it. You need the practice. And it will make a huge bit of difference when we get to forces and a tremendous amount of difference when you get to May and you're getting that five. All right. So. Sketch the horizontal position of the coin as a function of time. She dropped the coin. How much change did you get in the horizontal? Zero. Zero, why zero? Because it dropped straight down and on the Y, there was a delta Y and not a delta X. Right, she dropped it and then there's no force causing it to move horizontally because there's only one force and that's gravity and that's pulling it down. So there was no change. So we can come to this guy, let me scroll up. Oh, come on. There's a little sign in the corner of my screen, so I can't use the bottom right corner, but um, it's gonna look like this. It's constant. The horizontal position is constant as a function of time. Now we could have drawn it anywhere. We could have said, well, the horizontal position's right there. As long as we say it's not changing, right? We could put it anywhere, because it's based on an origin we didn't say that she dropped it right on the horizontal origin. So it can be anywhere we want it to be as long as it doesn't show a change over time. And imagine the lines I drew as being parallel to the horizontal axis and not like one looks like it's going down a little bit and the other one's going up a little bit anyway. All right, so that finishes page one. I'm gonna get us started on page two. Uh, apparently my finger draws lines as well. So now I'm going to get started on page two because here is where we're going to get into a situation where we're no longer just dropping something. Now we have a cannon firing a cannonball. Well, it fires a cannonball horizontally. So now we're moving horizontally, but that cannonball is also under the influence of gravity. So that cannonball is going to be falling. So it's going out forward and it's falling down. We've got two directions to deal with. If anything is occurring perpendicularly, they don't associate with one another, whether it's forces or even here in kinematics. So what we need to do is create an XY table. Anytime you have two dimensional motion, you need an XY table. So this is why I said I want to start separating X and Y because they don't play with each other. They don't get along. Now in the X direction, what are our variables? Well, Let's do the y first because that's the one we've been dealing with. So in the y direction that's up and down, well, we have delta y, the change, I'm sorry, I did delta t. We have delta y because that's the change in position. We have, what else do we have? What are our variables? Talk to me. Uh, acceleration. Acceleration, what else do we have? Uh, initial velocity. Okay, what else do we have? Uh, final velocity. Okay, and then time? We don't have that. Well, I'm just saying time exists in the, in the Y. Those are our possible variables, right? Okay, so then that's in the Y. Now, the reason that we have two velocities in Y is because there is an acceleration. You have to have a change of acceleration to have two different accelerations, right? I'm sorry, you have to have a change in velocity to have two different velocities. The only way to have a change in velocity is acceleration. All right, that acceleration comes from gravity, but in the horizontal, is there anything that would cause the velocity to change? 
You can use your heads. Yes, no, maybe so. Is there anything in the horizontal that would cause the velocity to change? Right, so physically move your heads. All right, I got some way. So there is nothing, right? Gravity goes in the vertical. There's nothing else. So there's nothing in the horizontal. So there's only one velocity in the uh, horizontal. We're going to call that Vx, the velocity in the x direction. There's only one because there's no acceleration. There's no way to speed up or slow down. Well, one velocity, no acceleration. There's a delta x because we're going to change position. So delta x. And then there's time. OK. There's only one place in this chart that they get along. And that is the time for each of these is the same. If you solve for time in one, you've got the time in the other. Outside of that, they are completely independent. So the time it takes for something to fall is the same amount of time it has to move horizontally. When I throw a ball and the person catching it misses it, once it hits the ground, it's not moving horizontally anymore. Forget about the roll, that's a separate thing. But as far as my throwing it horizontally and vertically, I throw, I'm throwing balls up in the air, right? And it can only move horizontally for the amount of time it's in the air. Once the vertical component says, hey, I hit the ground due to gravity, the horizontal component cannot be, it doesn't exist anymore. It stopped. They share time. Okay, so now that we sort of know that, let's put that to use, sort of. All right, so let's see what we have. We have a cannon fires a, a ball at a speed of 40 meters per second horizontally. Okay, we can deal with this. Um, let's see, we've got, that's my cliff. And then I'm gonna put my little cannon up here. The drawings are important. There's my, I even have like, see they, they light the fuse. And then the cannonball comes out here. So here's my cannonball, boom, it's out. And that cannonball's moving at uh, 40, meters per second. And this tower, it says, is from there to there is 35 meters. Okay, so we've got some information. We've drawn what they've told us, right? We want to sketch the vertical position of the cannonball as a function of time. The vertical position of the cannonball. Okay, um, if we still want to say that down is positive for gravity, since since it's, we're not throwing the ball up and letting it come back down, the, the ball is simply going to go down. I'm going to call gravity, I'm going to say acceleration is equal to um, 10 meters per second square. So what I can say is, is that it's going to start like this and then speed up vertically. As, I'm not talking about the cannonball going out horizontally. I'm only talking about its drop. It, has, it starts with a zero velocity going vertical. The cannon did not shoot it down. It shot it horizontally. The cannon did not give it any velocity in the vertical. So its initial velocity is zero meters per second. And this is in the vertical. I think vertical is C-A-L or C-L-E. Anyway, that's how I'm spelling vertical today. That's the vertical. It must be sad because I see a couple of smirks. All right, so anyway, um, B says sketch the vertical velocity of the cannonball as a function of time. The vertical velocity. Okay, well, the vertical velocity I'm saying starts around zero, then it's gonna increase and get bigger. So if I graph the vertical velocity, it would look something like that. Not horizontal velocity, just vertical velocity. How long does it take for the cannonball to hit the ground? Good question. Let's see what we know. Um, we know that the V naught was zero meters per second because it didn't shoot it downward. It just shot it perfectly horizontal. We know that um, acceleration is 10 meters per second squared. We know that the change in position from the top of the cliff to the ground was, let's see, 35 meters. And we're just looking for time at this point. Time equals question mark. We do not know anything about velocity, final velocity, in the vertical. 
Now that I've written that out, you can select the correct equation. You can rearrange the equation, then plug in your numbers and get up and get an answer. I'm going to leave this one to you because this is projectiles page uh, projectiles one page two, which is a part of today's assignment. So I'm going to get that kind of primed for you, but I'm going to move to the next question. Sketch the horizontal position of the cannonball as a function of time. The horizontal position as a function of time. Okay, that is going to be a linear line. It's going to start at the origin. And it's going to go straight out. How do I know that it's a linear line and not a parabola? It's not a curve. How do I know? Is it because it has a constant velocity? Yes. It has no acceleration, right? In the horizontal, there is no acceleration. If I have no acceleration, what does that mean? He just said constant velocity. That means this line has to have one slope. The slope will be equal to the velocity, in this case, 40 meters per second. They told us the cannon shot it horizontally at 40 meters per second. That means the slope of this line must be 40 meters per second. The slope must be 40, not anything else. All right, let's uh, here. How far away from the base of the tower does the cannonball land? Okay, we can do this. We know that the velocity in X is equal to 40 meters per second. That's what they shot it out at. Um, they're asking us for how far away delta X equals question mark. And we know the only other variable for the horizontal is time. Now, where are we going to get time from? We have to know time in order to solve this. Uh, question C. Exactly right. We're going to get it from the vertical that we answered in question C. So this time right here is also that time right there. If you can't determine the time in the horizontal, get it from the vertical because it's the same value. Now, what type of formula are we going to use? Well, I'm going to derive it from for you and then and so that you can see where it comes from. We know the formula delta x is equal to v naught t plus one half a t squared, right? We know this. Now, in the, horizontal, in, in the horizontal, what's the acceleration again in horizontal? Is there one? There's not one, right? Because a is zero. So if a equals zero, that means this whole thing is gone. So that means delta x is equal to the velocity. I'm going to put um, the velocity of x. I'm going to change it to vx because it's the velocity in x times time. Displacement is velocity times time. That's all you need to know in the horizontal. Your displacement, how far you go, sometimes it's called the range. The range is the distance in horizontal. That is equal to velocity times time. If you don't know velocity and time, if you don't know the time and to solve this, you get it from the vertical. Okay, and I think the last thing that I do is sketch the horizontal velocity of the cannon as a function of time. Well, we said that the velocity is constant in the horizontal, so we just show that it's constant. And we can put a little arrow tip on it if we want. Now, is this difficult? Yes, it's only difficult because it's the first hour that you've seen this. But hopefully you've got a really good head start on equations one and two and you've knocked those pretty much done. If not, get them done. But what I want you to do is I want you to finish this page, which just means you've got to do number five, A, B, C. And then when you go to projectiles two, there are three questions, number one, two, and three. And it talks about two-dimensional kinematics draw a picture, I guarantee you it helps. Write your given, do your X, Y tables for your given. Next class, we're gonna add in one more step, okay?